well called BPO and now being renamed into BPS or BPM. And while I cover on that, I would also touch upon a few of the key levers which the industry is currently using to mitigate the impacts of VUCA. But before we actually go in, let's quickly have a look at the background. Is VUCA a new phenomenon? As Sam very rightly pointed out, VUCA existed during BCs. And as you may call it a jargon, it was coined maybe a quarter of a century back. Then interestingly, why are we talking about it now? What is so important? Let's look at a very interesting analysis by the Boston Consulting Group. It shows turbulence. When you measure purely on economic business parameters, like profitability, growth, revenue, strikes more often, has increased intensity, and persists much longer in this current decade than what you have been seeing in the previous periods. Can we try to quantify it? Let's look at two Asian tigers. If you look at only India and China and the economic force that they have generated, it is 10 times the economic acceleration, 100 times the scale, and the economic force which is 1,000 times the size of the Industrial Revolution. When we are looking at growth of this space, VUCA is inevitable at this point of time. Let's look at the impact of VUCA on a few key industries before we get into BPS. Energy. The annual revenue of Saudi Arabia expected to go around by $40 billion this year. Oil price volatility. Transportation and logistics. Amazon, planning drones. Apple, planning a personal mobility solution. Too early to say whether you should call it a car or something else. Let's see. The third one. Any guesses what is this? A very recent photograph. This is, absolutely, this is a fully functional operating aircraft jet engine made completely from 3D printing. So what was perceived as an oxymoron in management terms before, called mass customization, is it something which is becoming a reality? Probably yes. Fourth one, we have two experts from media and telecom here. This is something I really like. The second one specifically. We used Facebook to schedule, Twitter to coordinate, and YouTube to show to the world. And what are we talking about? We are talking about the Arab Spring Revolution, which actually overthrew the political leadership of three countries. And we thought, at least I thought, Facebook was for connecting with school friends, and YouTube was for watching movies. So, what happened? Nicholas Taleb coined the term black swan as a statistical outlier, as something which cannot be predicted because there is no historical precedence. In the world of VUCA, we are unfortunately surrounded by black swans. That is a new normal. So let's look at how it impacts the industry which I represent business process services. Business process services is a horizontal industry like information technology. So it cuts across multiple industries. So the impact of a specific element of VUCA or multiple elements can be quite itself complex and ambiguous. Let's take one simple example which all of us can relate to. The first one, energy, the fluctuation of oil prices. Oil price fluctuation hits directly or indirectly almost everybody. But two industries which immediately come to our mind, which gets hit, are energy and transportation, the order in which it is mentioned. Let's take one example in transportation and logistics. One of the key sectors in transportation and logistics is airline, for which maybe anything between a quarter to 50% of the cost structure is the price of oil. So obviously, when the oil price goes down, the airlines have more money in their coffer, which they can invest elsewhere, notably being enhancing the passenger experience. And we, in business process services, have excellent offerings to actually partner with airlines to enhance their passenger experience. So this is an opportunity. But look at from the reverse side, the same oil impact on another sector of energy, which is oil exploration and drilling. These companies obviously take a hit. 
because because lower oil prices it's possible that the recovery period of drilling investments are longer does it impact even non-conventional energy sector yes shale oil on which or shale gas on which america survives requires the price to be about 70 to 80 dollars a barrel to be economical so sustained oil prices below that will make shale oil drilling uneconomical so the, all the offerings that we in business process services have for any of the oil exploration and drilling companies get ahead so same source completely contradictory impacts on two different industries indirectly impacting the business process services industry so what it essentially means for business if one word can describe VUCA it is unpredictability in business environment operations and outcome so what would be the clients looking at from partners like us sorry they look at predictable partners partners who will be willing to share risk and deliver predictable outcomes within a VUCA environment. So all the traditional levers of cost, quality, value within an overarching umbrella of predictability. So let's look at a few of the key levers which the industry, the business process services industry uses to handle VUCA or enhance predictability. Put it simple, take technology and people, make the base, top it up, with financial outcomes, package it, and wrap the whole thing in perception. Let's look at each of them in slightly greater details. The technology lever, three key elements, platforms, robotic process automation, and analytics. And each and every of them indirectly or directly impacts one or more of the elements of V, U, C, and A, what we call VUCA. Platforms brings predictability in information exchange and manages volatility in volumes. We all know of technology platforms. So let's be not, let me go to robotic process automation. I feel this has the potential to be the second biggest game changer in a people intensive industry like IT or business process services beyond computerization. What does it do? It manages uncertainty, the EU of VUCA, by complete elimination of human intervention. But it also manages complexity, and this is done in a far more interesting way. Few of these robots are cognitive. So while you actually perform simple tasks, they start learning on their own, and they pick up more complex tasks in the process. Additionally, more importantly, they free up the human capital to perform more complex tasks. So it manages complexity of operations as well as outcomes. Simple example, say when we, when we from the business process services industry handle the end-to-end -end claims for an insurance agent or an insurance organization, the claims management is a very repetitive and simple process. So now a claims associate can leave the claims management to the robot and can himself and herself upgrade to manage more complex stuff like managing appeals and grievances, which is more thought provoking and knowledge intensive. Analytics, of course, we can have an entire session on this. So manages volatility and uncertainty, both prescriptive and predictive. Let's go to the next level quickly. People three levels, leadership, ordinary employees, and a support system. In the environment of VUCA, we are looking at leaders who remain anchored to the long term. The long term vision cannot change while able to manage the volatility in the short term. And at employees, we are looking at adaptive employees, employees who are ready to cross kill and change with the volatile environment and operations. And all of these have to be supported by data-driven, real-time metrics. The third, all this is sufficient, but requires finally a business. So 
two key commercial models which convert this into a risk sharing commercial model with the client are transaction based and outcome based or risk sharing based transaction based simply pay as you use don't care about what people what infrastructure goes behind just pay as you use manages volatility and by risk and gain sharing obviously it means manages all the elements of the c and a however all this is not sufficient unless you are being perceived by the client as a predictable partner so it is all the more important for this industry to reposition itself in the perception map that you are not an outsourced workshop but essentially a partner who is ready to share risk and actually manage business end to end so one of the key levers which the industry has undergone is a change of name from business process outsourcing which essentially defined it to be an outsourced workshop to a business process management and services defining that we own end to end services manage them and share the risk so to summarize The key is to the ability to continuously change and reinvent oneself. Because if you don't, someone else will. Thank you. So we'll give it to Peter York. So. So a few months ago, a group of you know, a motley group of about thirty-five people. went to a coffee shop in chennai it was an evening meeting that they were having they were a part of a special interest group and uh, you know some of them had already come from home they had already had their cup of tea so out of those 35 people probably about 10 of 12 of them ordered tea or coffee and after about an hour and a bit they decided to adjourn and as they were leaving this coffee shop the manager of the coffee shop stepped up and said uh, sir apart from the bill you pay you got to pay a cover charge so they were rather shocked they said you know we been to many of your brand branded coffee shops in the past and uh, we've never paid a cover charge you know this is the first time we're hearing about it so where does it say that i have to pay a cover charge so there's a little bit of an argument between both uh, parties and finally these guys said okay forget it yaar let's pay the cover charge and push off so they paid the cover charge and they walked out of the coffee shop and within an hour a couple of them were avid bloggers and media enthusiasts they put up a post on facebook that said you know i am very surprised but we had coffee at this place and they charged us 1500 bucks just for a cover charge which was never in the rule book the manager was never able to show it and so on and so forth by about 8:30 that evening there were another 30 40 50 posts that had come up through the night people were posting unfortunately for this particular brand the conversation went away from the focus of this whole discussion which was the cover charge to things like have you been to that coffee shop the coffee is better there <laughs> so the whole conversation started going all over the place by 10:30 the next morning there were hundreds of posts that had come up from people all over the country and it was only then that this particular brand in question actually put out an apology mail an apology post and said we are very sorry for this inconvenience we will actually talk to the manager concerned in this particular branch and we will actually rectify the situation ladies and gentlemen things don't work from 9 to 5 these days things work around the clock you've got to be absolutely proactive in all the communication that you do you cannot wait till 10 o'clock the next morning to put out something because between the previous evening and the next morning your brand may already be fairly damaged with some very forthright and frank opinions from people who are out there today there are 7 billion people like us plus in the world today more than half of us are connected in some way or the other in india alone there are some 240 50 million people who are on the internet there are more than a billion of us who are on our smartphones and hand phones and whatever else gadgets we use what has happened in the last few years 
which makes this subject of VUCA very interesting is that there is a democratization of communication. Earlier, if you wanted to be a filmmaker, you had to go to probably the Film Training Institute in Pune, you had to do that course for many years, you had to graduate from there and you had to you know, get your certification. Not that that's not important today. But today, if five of us get together, get a camera which is probably not very expensive, get a script together, do a shoot, put it up on YouTube, we are probably likely to get ratings starting tomorrow morning. Good ratings or bad ratings, that's a different matter. But the point is, publishing content is not the preserve of certain people. Potentially, 7 billion people in the world today can say something about your brand. There is no restricting that, there is no putting a ban on that. And we've seen that in some of the most restrictive countries who censor media where things have leaked out. I mean, many years back, I remember I was in the Middle East and there was a particular article which appeared in The Economist. The article was overall positive about that particular country, but there was a certain paragraph in that country which threw a little bit of, you know, doubt about the leadership in that country. As soon as the copies of The Economist landed in the airport, they were seized and impounded. And none of us got to know about that. But all of us were very curious to know what was contained in those issues. So all we did is, we just called up somebody in another part of the world, got the copy, scanned and emailed to us. Barriers today are not there. Physical barriers, barriers of censorship and other things, they may exist, they may be monitored, but they are not there in the world around us. So in my mind today, if you are a corporate, if you are an organization, if you are an individual, it is about managing perception in the public eye which becomes all the more important in this fast changing world where comments are open to anybody. Now you can get very depressed about this and say, well, you know, I am open to all kinds of criticism, I am open to all kinds of issues. I mean, till very recently, for example, banks stayed away from social media because they were worried that they'd open a Pandora's box. And this is just an example. They'd open a Pandora's box in terms of communication because people might start putting negative comments and stuff like that. But you may not want to, you know, have a LinkedIn profile or a Twitter handle or whatever it is, but that does not in any way prevent anybody from saying something in public. So I would say we have to look at it not as a glass half empty, but as a glass half full. Because that is the opportunity that we need to we need to take. Which brings me to an important point that your communication in whatever you do has to be open, has to be transparent, has to be clear, but most importantly, has to be extremely proactive. We cannot wait till 10 o'clock the next morning. The response has to go out the same night. And this is particularly so when there is a crisis. We cannot afford to let things just you know, we cannot afford to keep quiet about it, but we need to be out there and be transparent about what we are, who we are. And I think one of the best ways of doing that is through content that gets refreshed virtually on a daily basis. Thank you. Let's save it to you, Karthik. Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to try and keep this as uh, simple and entertaining as possible. Uh, actually, uh, it's a huge challenge, you know, to all the pan panelists over here to come and speak uh, today because it's not so much about the topic, but to be the ones to come after lunch. So, <laughs> uh, all those of you who have been sleeping, I think it's time to wake up. <laughs> the discussion is going to start soon. All right, so uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, VUCA and uh, the role that advertising and communication can play in, in handling that. So, in fact, uh, this is one more VUCA in a presentation for you. 
All right. So VUCA, it's an uh, acronym with four letters, but there is already an acronym that was created recently with three letters. I'm sure the ones of you who were yawning until now sitting in the last bench would understand what those three words mean. It's definitely not where are the french fries. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in the advertising world, right, VUCA is, is an everyday reality. I mean, it's, it's not something new. So we have volatile clients, we have uncertain objectives that they want us to take care of. Uh, they have complexity of demand, so the CMO wants something, the brand manager wants something else. No, that's fine, I'm just cool using this, yeah. The brand manager wants something else, uh, the sales guys want something else. And uh, the, the complexity of demands is, is, is something else. And finally, the ambiguity in the success parameters, right? You come up with an advertising campaign, so what is the success? Is it more sales or is it that people love you or that the people remi remember you? Is it recall? So, so VUCA, hey, hey man, this is what I do every day. I mean, it's no big deal, all right? But we're not here to talk about my problems. So VUCA, it's about four words. But to me, it's one meaning. It's that when the shit hits the fan, you need to start dancing differently. You know, you just visualize that. Imagine what that means. That is what is VUCA, right? You need to start moving in ways that have not been put in down on a piece of paper as before. That is what is VUCA. It happens in your everyday life. Those of you who are doing this course, you are children of VUCA. Your parents are going through these emotions. The four emotions are VUCA. Trust me about the complexity of your personality, the ambiguity of your future and all those things, right? Okay, so here I'm going to talk to you about two examples and how advertising, uh, we used advertising to solve their problems and kind of delivered success uh, like never before. First, I'd like to talk to you about Flipkart. So when Flipkart came about, they were not the only e-commerce uh, or online player. There were other players. Uh, there were other players uh, like Webshop18 that used to sell cheap Chinese goods, you know. There, so there were, there were already different kinds of perceptions already established in that space. So when Flipkart wanted to get inside, one, they were already in a volatile, volatile uh, environment because India was just about seeing the uh, surge of modern retail, right? Big Bazaar and all was just coming up in a big way to the common man and everyone's experiencing walking down aisles where they can see thousands of products that they are never going to buy, right? But so that was firstly, and worst environment was already volatile. Two, the uncertainty of any kind of uh, uh, short-term profit. So it was very clear that even today you might have heard conversations, people will say Flipkart is not making any money, what is his model? You know, people have their own perspective. They say, oh, but, but yeah, they are the, one of the richest country, uh, companies in the country. So uncertainty of any kind of short-term profit. Secondly, the complexity of the Indian market, right? There was a cultural context to where e uh, online shopping was and whether it would be accepted uh, or how soon can it make, uh, you know, uh, inroads uh, into everyday life. So he was talking about telecom. So India was the country that completely just jumped the pager age and went into mobile phones, right? So online or the, the players in the online space were looking for something like that and Flipkart, you know, they, they had the vision to kind of do that ahead. So they were very clear for them to enjoy any kind of success, they had to create the category, right? They need to educate people what online shopping was, what was to ex expect from it and, and, and then only start getting them to start using them. Challenge, there would be other players who would also start piggybacking on that. But no, they had the vision to say, we're going to do something, we're going to do it first, we're going to do it right, we're going to get customers on our side. So uh, before we went out to do the kids campaign, I wanted to give you a little background. So nobody really knew what to go out and say, do we go and say number one e-commerce portal or we have billions of products or we have so many categories. What, what was it that we were going to go and say to people to get them to start using Flipkart, right? Uh, here, you don't even trust your neighbor, you know, with anything. How are you going to trust somebody that you don't see who appears on a, on a window, on a, you know, on a, on a laptop or a computer? How are you going to put your money out there? So we actually did a research and we found that Indian, culturally, Indians had issue with online shopping. And there were three issues. One, what will happen to my money? Right? How you put credit card fraud and all that. First, so first fear of what will happen to my money. All right? Two, how do I know that the products that are being sold are original? They have put some photograph over there. How do I know what is being bought over there? And finally, if there is a problem, 
who do I go to, right? If there's a problem, I buy it from Pi Electronics, I go back and I shout at that salesman and bring down the house. What will you bring down? Your own house. There's nobody, right? So th we found out that these were the main problems that you know the whole country had issues with. And so we created the No Kidding, No Worries campaign that very specifically addressed these three problems. So Flipkart actually created the cash on delivery service based on this research. They actually went out and said, we'll give you original products only and original warranties. And they created the 30-day replacement policy for India at that time. Of course, today all of this seems like, yeah, everybody does it. But they were the first mover and, and they set the tone for e-commerce. So just to kind of break the monotony of my own voice, I'll play you the three commercials that actually changed the future of Flipkart. Do we have audio? Yes, sir. Wi-Fi mila, to nichod lega kya? Of course. Online shopping. What you're ordering now? MP3 player. Or kuch faulty nikla to? Flipkart.com pe. Mm -hmm. No chance. Or agar hua bhi to, replace kar denge. Replace? Awesome. What's going to be your first song? Ringa Ringa Roses. That's the classic. 30 day replacement guarantee on all products. Flipkart.com, the online mega store. Sagarna just doesn't get it. Kya hua? He's scared of online shopping using credit card. Old school. Anyways, he got a mobile from Flipkart.com. Flipkart.com? What is it? Cash on delivery. Mobile ghar pocha, then he paid. Superb. Magar Sagar kaun? My dad re. Cash on delivery with all products. Flipkart.com. The online mega store. Yaar, I need a new laptop. Laptops or boyfriends badalte raho. Paga mat, bol ki dar se loon. Try flipkart.com online. Original cheese chahiye boss. Original products with original warranty. Warranty? Who told you? My boyfriend. Oh, Kapir. Handsome kaan hai aaj kal? Original products with original warranty. Flipkart.com, the online mega store. Thank you. So, so the idea to use children was actually we wanted to let people know uh, that online shopping was really simple and it was like child's play. I mean, of course, we never went out and said that. And we, we decided to use kids only for the first campaign because the line, no kidding, no worries. But it just became such a huge success that that became the brand language for Flipkart for about three years. I still don't know why they stopped using the kids, but when I find the answer, call me back, I'll tell you. Uh, the other example that I want to talk to you about is a, is a recent uh, phenomenon, which is Ola cabs. So Ola has been around in India for about three and a half years. They started with two cities. Today they're available in about 22 cities. And they've also had a total VUCA situation uh, and where advertising has had to kind of find a way to communicate what they have to communicate without actually getting their own foot in their mouth. So biggest situation for them, volatile environment again. In India, the, the, uh, it, it's totally driven or until now by unorganized transport mafia, right? You go out there and say, Barala, 10, 10, 10 rupees extra, one and a half meter, you have to go, Bata, everything, all kinds of nonsense. I mean, the, there is no set standard rate for anything, right? So that's because it's controlled by, by you know, unorganized uh, mafia boys. And the hugest resistance for, for, for Ola when they came into the market was, uh, was from the for, from the taxi and transport uh, community. They did not want these guys to come. And uh, so they created all kinds of problems for them. In fact, when the founder got an FIR for on his name in Bombay for not having a taxi license to run uh, this business, Ola. So luckily for him, I mean, he was an IIT graduate, so he saved himself. So he came out and he said, I'm not, I'm not running taxis, I'm running a platform. It's a tech platform. The cab guys who are running the taxis, and they're using my platform to sell to the customers, right? So that, that was that, that is the kind of volatile environment that this business started. Second,